Our Father in heaven, we humbly come to your presence this morning. Lord, we are here on an invitation. On an invitation, Lord, to see you, to commune with you. Lord, speak to us. Energize us. Teach us. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Story begins in 1818. Ignace Phillips Simmerwise was born into a world of dying women. The finest hospitals lost one out of six young mothers to the scourge and the scrooge a bed child fever. A doctor's daily routine began in the dissecting room where he performed autopsies. From there, he went on his way to the hospital to examine expectant mothers without ever pausing to wash his hands. Dr. Semmelweis was the first man in history to associate such examinations with the resultant infection and death. His own practice was to wash with a chlorine-based solution, and after 11 years and the delivery of 8,537 babies, he only lost 184 mothers, about 1 in 50. He spent the rest of his life lecturing and debating with his colleagues that fever is the cause by decomposed material. He said, I have shown how it can be prevented. I have proved all that I have said. But while we gentlemen talk, women are dying. I am not asking anything worth world shattering. I'm asking you to simply wash your hands. But virtually no one believed him. Doctors and midwives had been delivering babies for thousands of years without washing their hands and no outspoken Hungarian was going to, cha to change that now. Simmerwise died insane at the age of 47. His wash basins discarded, his colleagues laughing at his face and the death rattle of a thousand women ringing in his ears. In scripture, we have several references relating to bathing, washing, and cleanliness. The Hebrew word to bathe does not distinguish between bathing a part of the body like the hands or the feet or the whole body. In the Old Testament, most mentions of bathing have to do with ritual washing, although bathing for cleanliness is noted. But far more than bodily cleanliness, the Bible associates cleanliness with holiness, righteousness, and ultimately being right with God. And now we turn to the story, John, John 13. Do you have your Bible? Let's go to John 13. Open up scripture. John 13. The moment in time in the upper room of the place at Jerusalem, Jesus sitting at the table with his disciples where they had gathered to celebrate the Passover. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, directed the attention of the twelve as representatives of the new messianic community. We read, read with me, John 13. And we're going to start in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was turning and returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them 
with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later, yes, Peter, later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you as an example that you should do this as I have done for you. Verily, verily, remember? Amen. Amen. This is a literary device that John uses in the gospel to catch your attention. Something's going to go down. Pay attention. Amen. Amen. I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Right off the bat, we see that the food washing ceremony should be understood within the context of Jesus' most intense love for his disciples. During this time, Jesus, food washing was customarily done. The work of a servant always, all, almost always before the meal. Surprisingly, the text marks and gets to our attention and makes it clear that this had not been done. It was only after the meal that Jesus used this as an opportunity to teach a profound lesson on humility. Jesus says, verse 4, He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Some scholars say that he would have looked like a slave. But this action summarized the whole life of service to humanity, a service that would reach an anticipated expression on the cross. As recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, there was a dispute among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. There was a contention of selfishness, strife, supremacy among the disciples. By his humble, unselfish service, Jesus showed his disciples that the way of the kingdom is one of humble and faithful service. Can you imagine? Imagine yourself in the room. You're up there in Jerusalem and you're in the upper room. And when you see across the room, you see in the table, we see Matthew. We see the sons of Zebedee. We see Peter and the other disciples waiting for someone to come and do the job that no one wanted to do. Jesus, the pure, spotless Lamb of God, the King, the Lord, the one who deserves to be served is the one serving everyone. Verse 5, Jesus took the towel in the basin and one by one began to wash his disciples' feet. And listen to this. According to Jewish custom, extending back probably to the time of Jesus, people generally bathed before attending the feast and would only need their feet washed from the dust of the journey to the feast. A ceremony of hospitality was normally performed by a servant or a slave. The washing of the feet was one of the duties of a foreign slave. Not even a Jewish slave was expected to perform such a service regarded as menial tasks, 
meaning that the word did not require my, much skill and lacked prestige. There was no servant, no slave present on the occasion of the Last Supper. One of the disciples should have taken the task and said, Lord, I want to volunteer. But no one volunteered. Their heads were too inflated. They could not see clearly. And what's more interested about all this is that Jesus knew their character of those who he was ministering to. He knew their past. He knew their present. He knew what they were going to do in the future. And he began to wash their feet one by one. He knew their thoughts. He knew their actions. He knew their conversations. He knew their decisions. He knew their dreams. And he continued to wash their feet. And by doing so, by his example, Jesus demonstrated the ultimate love he has for sinful human beings. If that's not love, then I don't know what is. Verse 6, Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? In the original language, there's a strong emphasis there on the pronouns you and my. Can you imagine? Some scholars and commentators say that and suggest that Peter, when he said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? That he might have drawn his legs as he spoke that. Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Don't you remember that I am the first one that you chose? Don't you remember that I am in your inner circle? Don't you remember that I am the only one that walked on water? Lord, I don't need to wash. I've had enough water. I wonder if some of us today display the very same attitude as Peter, we say to Jesus, don't wash me. I don't need it. As if to say, I don't need God in my business. I don't need God in my family. I don't need God to get ahead. I don't need God in my marriage. I got good health insurance. I got good retirement. With the tornadoes that came in last week, I wonder if that's good enough. That's the sad reality that we as human beings experience. And finally, verse 7 says that Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Verse 8, No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. But in this dialogue with Peter, Jesus clearly demonstrated that food washing also involved a spiritual cleansing without which no one could sit at the table to have fellowship with him. From this perspective, the action of Jesus was fully related of his atoning work on the cross. When Jesus said, you shall never wash my feet, his words showed arrogance, self-confidence. No one could humble, no one of humble surrender. He showed that his heart was misled by his proud spirit. As followers of Jesus, the truest humility comes when we accept the self-sacrificing grace of God. When, we, when Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist to wash the dust of his disciples' feet, he desired by the very act to wash the alienation, to wash the jealousy, and to wash the spirit that they had. It was not just about the feet. It was about the heart. Philosopher James K.A. Smith says that our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the well springs from which our actions and behavior flow. Our wants reverberate from our hearts, the epicenter of the human person. God is after the human heart, our longings and desires. As missional citizens of the kingdom, to follow Jesus means to align our loves and longings to His. 
to want what God wants, to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave the world. He is all in all. A vision encapsulated by the shorthand, the kingdom of God. Our telos, the end point of our journey, is away from a, from a world of pain, grief, and tragedy. A place where Jesus is our King, where Jesus is our Lord, and brings restoration and renewal here on earth as a final demonstration of his love, bringing shalom, wholeness, as our Prince of Peace. Jesus, our didaskalos, is our teacher who doesn't just form our intellect, but forms our very loves. For you see, he isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into our mind. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, and your longings. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in you. There where you're sitting down, he sees you. He knows you. Bottom line, it is not about only washing those dusty feet. For they will become dirty again. It's a matter of the heart. Verse 9 says, Then Simon Peter said, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Because that's the moment when he realized that by refusing Jesus, he would have no part with him. Maybe this morning, deep inside of us, we're holding pride, selfishness in our hearts. We have things in our lives that are driving us away from Jesus. We know we are not right with God. We know we're not right with him. Yet we are unwilling to let him in, to cleanse us in such a way that he can only do. MPC, let us grow in humility and love, surrendering our lives and faith to Jesus, allowing him to transform our character, our life, our hearts. This story is an invitation to let the God of heaven wash you completely to let the waters of Jesus Christ flow down like a flood and make you perfectly whole and if you do then you will be able to say like King David create in me a pure heart O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me my sacrifice O God is a broken spirit a contrite heart, you, God, will not be this vice. This is our prayer today, Lord. I give you my life. I will allow you to wash me completely, to renew me. I want to make things right with you. It's over. I'm done fighting. The showdown is now. You know me, Lord. I'm here. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we surrender ourselves to you. We're done fighting. We're done running. Lord, do in our lives the things that we cannot do for ourselves. Renew us. Transform us. Clean our heart. Live in us. We humbly pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Rita, today is the big day. And we're so happy because today, Jim and Rita have decided to publicly make a commitment to Christ. Today is the day. I know that we have talked about this for several weeks, and I'm sure that you guys have been waiting for this for a long time. The story is long. The journey has been long. God has taken you through some incredible adventures 
but you're here now. And I know that as I was talking with them and as I met with them, they were like, Pastor, I just feel like this church is my home. I feel like this is my home. And I want to read a, 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 a passage that may or may not, but I'm sure that it is. Speaks a little bit to not just your journey and not just your journey, but speaks to our journey as a body of Christ. Luke chapter 15, Luke 15, and I read from verse 17, and it says this way, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's higher servants have food to spare? And I am here starving to death. Mm. I will set out and go back to my father and said to him, Father, I have sinned against my heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher servants. So he got up and he went to his father. And praise God that he went to the father. And when he went to the father, you know what happened? The father was out there in the road waiting for him. And the father went to him and ran to him. And he hugged him, embraced him, clothed him, put a ring on his finger and said, Welcome home, son. It's the same thing that Jesus does for us. It's the same thing that Jesus said, Jim, welcome home. Rita, welcome home. And, and, and God comes along the, red, the road and he comes and hugs you and embraces you. How many of us have been praying for Jim and Rita? Raise your hand. You can put your hands down. See all those people that have been praying for you? Have been praying for this decision to happen? So at this moment, what I want to do is just re go through the vows, read the vows. And then I know that you said to me, Pastor, I've heard those before. <laughs> but we're going to go through these. And then um, you can grab that mic right there. And then you just say, yes, or I do, or whatnot. And then that way, that way we can go from there. So, Jim and Rita, do you renounce the world and the sinful ways and have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, believing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you of your sins and given you a new heart? Yes, we do. Praise God. Amen. Do you, David, do you Jim and Rita, believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, that the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian, uh, for the Christian and, and you make a covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. We do. We do. Amen. Do you, Jim and Rita, believe in the church organization and its purpose to support the church with your tithes and your offerings and your personal effort and influence. We yes. do and will. Amen. And finally, Jim and Rita, do you believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of the Bible prophecy, and that the people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into fellowship, and you desire to be a member of this local congregation of the world church? Yes, Amen. Amen. So this, this moment, what we're going to do is we're going to do a special prayer of dedication. And actually, I think we should, we should do the, the vote right now, and then we'll do the prayer. So does someone make a motion to accept Jim and Rita as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Amen. Do we have a second? Motion is passed. Amen, amen. So now, let's go ahead and pray. And so I want to ask you, if you have been praying for Jim and Rita, 
and you want to continue praying for them in the next 30 and 60 days from now, because I know even though there's joy in heaven and we're rejoicing and we're happy, there's another side that's not happy. So right now, they need our prayers. So if you want to commit to God before God in this witnesses, in the next 30, 60 days, you want to pray especially for Jim and Rita. Would you stand making that commitment that you want to pray for them? In the next 60 30, 60 days, if you want to visit them and check on them and see, hey, how you're doing? Do you want to commit to that too? Great. Awesome. Praise the Lord. So now, where you are, clo eyes closed, uh, head bow. if you can extend your hand towards them as, a, as, as, as just a sign that you are with them, and that you are uh, just on their side, a commitment to you, if you want to raise your hand towards them as we consecrate them to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we are here present and rejoicing in the great things that you have done in the life of Jim and Rita and how you have been so merciful with them through their journey and faith. And we want to ask, Lord, that you will come into their lives, anoint them, protect them, Lord, and that you would put a hedge of protection, protect them from the fiery darts of the devil. And Lord, consecrate them for your service, that they would know, Lord, that you are with them, that you love them, the great sacrifice, the great payment that you have done was for them. Lord, may you continue to be with them as you have been faithfully all these years. Your timing is perfect. You know them more thoroughly than you know that they know themselves, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Don't leave yet. Party's not done yet. So I'm going to ask Beverly to come over. and to get, We have special flowers for you. And then Bernard, we have a book for you. I know I, 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 I kind of cheated, you know, because I skimmed through that book to see what it said. And let me tell you, top notch. This real good book that will help you in your walk with Jesus. And inside of it... And inside of it, we also have a special note that it's just showing here the day in which you publicly gave your life to Jesus. And it's just showing the date there so that when you read this book, it can be a reminder to you of the commitment that you've done for the Lord and that you and me may remain faithful to Him. And so let's just pray one more time. Lord, we love you. We are all in you and we're rejoicing with heaven, the celebration of this great uh, commitment. It's no longer private. It's public now. Everyone knows. But Lord, we are rejoicing for the, for the good things that you do in our lives. Continue to protect Jim and Rita. Show love. Show them that you are there with them and that you care for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Praise the Lord. Does anybody want to welcome them officially? Show warmth to the church? Praise the Lord. As we start this afternoon now, uh, let us start this part of the service with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're gathered here today to remember your great sacrifice for us and just your love towards us, all the things that you've done 
to save us from sin. Lord, as we remember your great sacrifice, what you've done for us, may we continue to be faithful to you. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reads in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this moment, we'll ask Bernard to pray for the bread. Those who are able will kneel here in the front. If you wish to kneel there where you are. And then we'll pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we stand amazed at your sacrifice for us beyond our comprehension. And Lord, we are so grateful for without Jesus, we would have no hope. But he is our blessed Redeemer. He is our blessed hope. We look forward to his coming but now we remember his sacrifice for us, the broken body, the cruelty of the cross, but the greater cruelty of carrying our sins, which he willingly did for us, that those who receive Jesus may indeed have eternal life. Amen. We thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We may participate. First Corinthians 11, verses 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is my cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to go ahead and pray. Those who are able will kneel here in the front and we'll pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, Abba, we're so thankful for your goodness, for that blood that washes our sins away. Fruit of the vine, or as is referred to at, in the Gospels as the cup. That great sacrifice, Lord, that you've done for us. And because of that blood, Lord Jesus, our sins are washed away. How precious is, Lord, that blood that makes me white as snow. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your great sacrifice. And we don't, we don't only look back, Lord, at what you have done, but we look forward to being able to be there with you in heaven and rejoicing with the angels and celebrating with you in heaven. This is our prayer. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
sorry. I got you covered. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat and this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let us drink together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallelujah. Praise be to your name, O God the great sacrifice that you've done in the cross for us. We can never repay such a great sacrifice. The only begotten Son sent to earth to save humanity, to save a wretch like me. Lord, I was far away, stepping into darkness, But then your grace poured out and came, Lord, and washed me. And now I am made whole. I'm complete in you, Jesus. That is our prayer, Lord. Help us to continue remembering, to continue to be faithful in you, Lord, to abide in you, that you will abide in us. That is our humble prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.